Okay, fantastic. Um, we're going to start now. Um, welcome to our latest uh, in the Corp Carbon Corp webinar series, um, which is all about heat pumps today. And um, we're fantastically privileged to welcome uh, Florence Collier from Humble Bee. Um, Flo, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself, your background, um, your professional competencies? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm Florence Collier. I'm a mechanical engineer and passive house designer. Um, I used to work for uh, the, the consultancy Arup, um, and I did that for 20 years um, in, uh, in London, in Milan, and then in Manchester. And then two and a half years ago, I decided to set up on my own. Uh, and I've worked closely with the Carbon Co-op. I've delivered a, a few webinars now. Um, I'm also trying to do my own retrofit, so um, there's all sorts of synergies. And we all. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what I work for. Don't I? <laughs> um, then, uh, yeah, so now I'm one of the retrofit assessors, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer some of your questions tonight. Yeah, so yeah, Flo's, as she says, um, an assessor, retrofit assessor on our people powered retrofit program, uh, which is for domestic retrofit in the greater Manchester area and beyond. Um, and also has been doing some specialist um, m &E design work um, and um, calculations on heat pump installations. Um, so she's eminently well qualified for today's session. Um, before we start some ground rules um, or, or give you an idea of what's gonna happen, uh, uh, we'll present for about an hour, probably, um, hopefully not longer than that, maybe a lot shorter, and then we'll have, we'll make as much room as possible for questions, because uh, we've run these sessions before, there's been loads of questions, um, and we'll end at half seven, we won't go beyond that. Um, we can't read the chat during the presentation, or maybe we can fleetingly, so we can't really engage as much um, in the ongoing discussions, but do use the chat. Uh, we'll, we review it afterwards and we read every comment, um, and if there's any requests or whatever, we can pick those up. Um, if you have a question for the session, use the Q&A function on the toolbar uh, there, um, which should be there for you. And we'll pick those up at the end. Again, I'll, we'll try really hard um, to uh, pick up as many as possible. It might not be possible, uh, but I'm sure we'll run future sessions. Um, what I want to say is don't use the Q&A for chatting. Use the chat because sometimes people respond and it's a conversation. Just try and pose questions in the Q&A and leave that. The chat for the chat box. Yeah, OK. Still getting used to all the Zoom, even after a year. Um, and the session will be recorded. We'll share a recording um, on our website. It'll be available probably from tomorrow morning, along with the presentation. So you'll get all that. So you don't need to worry about getting that. Um, yeah, I think that's everything from ground rules. Um, we're going to start with some polls. Uh, I've written down on my notepad polls. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, it'd be great to know who you are, where you're from. Uh, you're a householder, you're a contractor, installer, designer, policymaker, and you can choose multiple choices here you don't have to stick you don't have to stick to one particular label or another um feel free to identify as many different things <laughs> uh, but this helps gives us an idea of who's in the room the virtual room such as it is a couple more seconds and you got everyone maybe everyone's voted okay um so you hopefully you'll see that so 90 percent of people are householders fantastic um, we've got a few contractors, not that many, a few engineers, a few policy makers. Um, fantastic. But ma majority of people are householders. And that's indeed where we're going to pitch the session. I do have another poll. Um, oh, Zoom have changed all their, um, all their little bits. So it's quite hard to <laughs> stop sharing to begin with. Quite hard to track where everything is. Here's another thing. So, I where are you on your journey, <laughs> such as it is on heat pumps? You're just trying to understand the basics, assess whether it's for you. Are you getting involved in the business if you're in that contractor designer? Are you rectifying a model already installed? We do, we do unfortunately have a bit of a legacy of um, people that have in, uh, had installations that are not necessarily working ideally, which is part of why we run these sessions to make sure people don't. 
uh, that doesn't you don't encounter that. Fantastic! I'll end that in that there. Share those results up. You can see so most people assessing whether this is for them or understanding the basics. Maybe like a fifth of people it might be interested in working in the area. If you know we've had people who are um, installers, designers. And just a couple of people are uh, looking to rectify a model already installed, and I do, we are sympathetic to that. Um, we'll try and pick stuff up in the Q and A if there's if there's relevance. What I what I should say is what we can't do, and say this on every webinar is we won't be able to um, make rec specific recommendations about your specific house. Um, we 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 can't do that by the uh, magic of the internet, unfortunately. And we wouldn't want to give advice that you then act on and it's wrong because we've not seen it um, in person. What we can do is talk about generalities and signpost you to information and say, if I were you, I would go about that in this way, you know, and it's, it's generally going to be about process. We generally won't say you need a three millimeter pipe for that um, or similar. Okay, well, let's get cracking then. Uh, we understand, yeah, it's basically a beginner's guide to heat pump. Um, and um, so we start with six things that you need to bear in mind um, if you're you're looking to install or you're trying to assess whether this is right for you. Um, those six things, it's not a boiler. A heat pump is not a boiler, and I think it's important to make that distinction. Um, a boiler you turn on and off gives you... Uh, really like um, strong heat, powerful heat at, at will. Um, a heat pump gives ambient constant heat. So it's like a different, it's a different way of understanding how to heat your house. Um, so in this, we'll also address what you need to think about, what you need to do to your house to make it heat pump ready. Some of the basics or some of the key things to be thinking about. Um, some of the things about whether you've got the space, do you have the budget, what kind of money we're we talking about. Um, and if you're going for it, what do you do next? You know, how big is it? Where do you need help? How are you going to buy it? How are you going to commission it? Um, there's so many different types. What's the best for your needs? And then we're going to finish with thinking about installing, operating, and monitoring, which seems like, you know, oh, that's the easy bit. We've done everything, but actually it can be some of the areas where there can be problems. Uh, Flora, do you want to comment on these areas at all? Yeah, um, just the idea that you can't just sort of swap your swap your heat pump for your bo your boiler for your heat pump um and that's just key to understanding all, all of it really mm. and we'll talk a bit about what those differences are as we as we go through yeah uh -huh. so a heat pump's not a boiler um it's interesting um we talked about this previously about um, a heat pump operating a bit like a fridge in reverse um, in that a fridge kind of um, it expands air that draws heat out of, you know, it doesn't expand air, it expands a coolant which draws heat yeah. out of the um, out of a fridge. But a heat pump works in a different way. In, in as simple as way as possible, Flo, can you explain <laughs> how, how it does work then? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, because the refrigerant has a different boiling point to um, to most liquids that we deal with. Um, we're basically utilizing the, um, the sort of latent energy process of expanding and um, expanding a, a refrigerant to a gas and then compressing it back into a refrigerant into a liquid. Um, and it's, it's a cycle. So it goes around this cycle and you either have heat rejected to, a, to an area or you take heat out of an area. Does that make sense? Mm, so, mm, so. Um, so the fridge will take heat out of uh, its environment, reject it to the back of the fridge. Mm. It's um, why the heat, the, it can be hot behind a fridge, you know. Exactly. You say, yeah. Oh, why is that? You know. Yeah. And mm. that's why you need the ventilation. So you can actually remove that heat from the back of the fridge. Mm. Um, whereas with a heat pump, we're actually taking air uh, heat out of the air outside. So that, that process, that bit of the loop is outside. Um, taking um, heat out of the outside and uh, putting it into the um, into the home. Sorry, I, I mm. think I said that the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> the, the bit that's inside the fridge normally would be outside. You're taking heat out mm. uh, and then uh, putting it into uh, your space at a, a higher temperature. 
And is there like a limit to what that process? If it's if it's like cold outside, it's a cold night. Does that mean that my heat pump won't work? There's no there's no ability to do that. No, it just means um, the cycle itself um, is less efficient, but you can still extract heat from from um, cold air, mm, mm, and that's mm. the bit that is uh, is quite hard to um, to get your head around. I suppose those of us that have done physics, we know that there's like energy within air, right? Well, not within air, within um, a space, right down to absolute zero, which is sort of That's minus right. 200 and something. Yeah. So actually, when you work out the cycle and the temperatures and the efficiencies, you would use the, the absolute temperature scale. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that kind of helps to, to get um, to imagine how you could get heat out and so in terms of the energy required the energy required the heat pump requires is electricity to um drive that compressor yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh you put electricity electrical energy into the compressor that's that's what sort of um pushes everything together um and the amount of energy that you put into that uh is smaller than the amount of heat energy that you get out the other the other end because you're actually using not ju not just that energy which is work um but also the the fact that it's expanding into a gas mm. um, draws out yeah. more energy we we'll, we can talk about this um uh, cop and such yeah. there's different types of, different types of installation so the the most typical and although we might talk a bit more about air source but there is ground source and air source so ground source is like digging a trench you know around your property and extracting the heat from the ground and air source is just simply bringing in the air from outside and doing that ex the um doing the exchange there um what's the difference between monoblock and, and like a single and a double and a split and the air to air what are those types yeah so the monoblock is basically that you have everything in the outdoor unit um, so that whole cycle happens in the outdoor unit and you transfer the heat um, into water pipe work, which then goes to your house. Um, a single and a double just means that you have a single fan or a double fan. That just depends on the, uh, the size of your unit. So how much heat you need to supply to heat your house. Um, whereas a split, uh, those two halves of the, of the cycle are split. So you've got refrigerant going in, uh, going from the outdoor unit to an indoor unit, the hydronic unit. Um, and that needs to be, because it's gas um, in the pipework, that would need specialist in installation. Mm. Okay. And then yeah. in terms of like the kit, you know, what's involved, <laughs> we've got an outdoor unit um the indoor unit and a buffer tank is optional what's a buffer tank so in order for the heat pump to operate um as efficiently as possible you need enough water in the system the whole system um to sort of iron out the um uh, the peaks and troughs as it were and sometimes there's enough water in the system because you've got i don't know uh, loads of pipe work, underfloor heating, um, massive radiators, etc. You've got a big house or whatever. Um, you might even have a thermal store. Mm. Um, but sometimes uh, that volume just isn't enough. It, it means that your heat pump will, st will start cycling a lot more um, in order to meet your, your demands. Mm -hmm. So a buffer tank gives you that additional capacity then to enable that smooth transfer then yeah it gives a bit of inertia to the system yeah. mm. and the expansion vessel um every um pressurized and hot water system needs an expansion vessel it just takes up the the volume that you get the excess volume that you get when you heat up water so you know, water will um, mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and then hot water cylinder so i think many of us have spent the last 20 years taking out 
<laughs> that are hot water cylinder and selling it for scrap for 50 quid. Um, does this mean if we're getting a heat pump, does this mean we have to recover that space that we gained and throw out the, you know, the new cupboard and put a heating tank back in? And is it as simple as if I have a, if I still have a heating tank for whatever reason, can I just keep that and use it with a heat pump? Um, so each case will be different, but generally speaking, you will need a hot water cylinder um, to deliver your um, your hot water to your taps. Um, and it does depend how much, so you, you can't really have instantaneous hot water from a heat pump system, um, not, not easily anyway. Um, and also the temperatures involved are much higher. So you need to, you need to be able to top up that water temperature if you want to use your heat pump as efficiently as possible. Mm. So we'll see, I think, do we get to see the sort of temperature differences between, um, between different systems? I think we do. I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but basically the efficiency of the pump, of the heat pump, um, very much depends on how much, uh, of a, how little a temperature difference you have between um, the external and the internal. Mm. So that, that more ambient heat means you need to, you know, build it up and store it in a heat tank. And I guess there are there are super duper new kind of hot water cylinders that are maybe a bit of an improvement on like the the brass tank with a coat on. Yes. So the other thing is, if you are using your heat pump as your primary hot water um, source, uh, because the temperatures are lower, you're going to have to have a much longer coil inside to, to get that heat transfer through to your your hot water and um, there's another you know there's a there's a large movement back to hot water cylinders also just so you can integrate that with renewables so mm. um, solar thermal um, there's always been a, a a requirement for a hot water cylinder for solar thermal and then if you're moving moving away if we're moving away from solar thermal because uh, because of issues in installation etc when People are now installing PV and diverting any excess um, uh, renewable energy from their PV systems into their hot water mm. So it's a, basically an energy storage for uh, for the house. It's a battery, but made of water rather than like hazardous, heavy chemicals. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we we've got that possible integration with renewables, and that there's sort of multiple different ways because there's obviously if you have that hot water cylinder, there's a potential to drop excess power from PV panels, but then there's also potential to run the heat heat uh, pump from from sort of PV because it's electricity. So there's lots of potential there. Yeah. So we talked about the magic of heat pumps, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which uh, somehow transfer, which breaks the, the laws of thermodynamics by <laughs> uh, um, putting a uh, small amount of energy and getting more out. But do you want to talk a little bit, um, which it doesn't break the laws of thermodynamics, but um, do you want to talk a bit about COP? Because it's, see, it's a, in a measure that you can see banded about quite a lot in sales materials and that sort of thing. Um, what does that mean, COP? Yeah, so it stands for coefficient of performance. So it's a it's a measure of how efficient um, uh, a piece of, of equipment is in, in this particular cycle, the refrigerant cycle. Um, and most simply put, you uh, if you have if you put uh, one kilowatt hour of electrical energy into the compressor um, and other um, electrical parts of your heat pump and you get four uh, kilowatt hours of heat um, out uh, in in terms of your your radiator systems um, that means your COP is four mm -hmm. um, and the reason we're kind of doing these webinars uh, especially about air source heat pumps is that traditionally sort of We've been talking about ground source heat pumps being um, the most uh, efficient because of the stable temperatures and slightly higher temperatures of the ground. Um, but actually, if you also act on the temperatures you're delivering the water at inside the house and you, you optimize that air source heat pump so that um, so that you get the best out of it, actually you can get to similar um, COPs 
uh, instead of just running a, a ground source heat pump, which is a lot more expensive and, and disruptive to install. And in terms of COPs, what is a good COP? What if people are looking at models? And I guess maybe we should talk about the difference between what you read in a in a brochure and what mm. you actually might get. But in terms of like what you actually might get, what is a good COP and and how does that compare? You know, is there a comparison there for gas boilers or or something? You know, in terms of like ah, oh, if I get a COP of this, it'll be be worth me replacing my gas boiler. Yeah. So um, COP is actually meaningless unless you specify the temperatures at which you're. Uh, the, the, two, the temperatures of the hot and cold uh, bodies that you're talking about. So um, there are standards at which uh, that give you the temperatures at which those COPs are given into um, manufacturers' literature. So, for example, and it's determined by la laboratory testing. So, uh, for example, a seven degree ambient temperature and a flow temperature of 45 degrees, that would be a standard um, set of criteria and then they'd give you the COP for that. Mm. So you can compare models and, and what have you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's a good COP that we might look oh, yeah, for from our from an air source heat pump that we've installed, let's say and done all so the right things. I think if you're managing to get um above three for just heating and above two and a half for heating and uh, hot water, um I think you can you can probably be quite proud, um, but you can get up to four or five. And you know, we've had some webinars from people who've, who've really optimized their, their installations and they've managed to get um, in excess of five, even with an air source heat pump. Mm -hmm. And it's worth saying that there is some behavioral, that, that you know, because what you might read in a brochure, there you go, and that's maybe that's been found in like laboratory conditions or such. But you know, there are behavioral influences. Like if you were to run it in a very different way or mess the settings in a certain way, then it could mean that it's running less efficiently. So hence yeah. that's why um I think we would we would always like a note of caution in terms of what you read in the manuals. There's been a fantastic report by Tipperary Energy Agency uh based in Ireland, they've done more than 300 installs, got all the data there, and, and are showing like 3.2, I think, was uh, what they were achieving, which is fantastic. But in the in the in the brochure, they might be four or five. So but um yeah, and that's what we were saying in terms of that will mean that your efficiencies are kind of bettering. A, or maybe you know around about a gas boiler yeah and seasonal performance factor you know so it changes over the period of the year i guess yes um and it's a measured annual efficiency of the, the heat pump at a particular location so it's a slightly different um i mean it's still the same numbers ish uh that go in but at different um in a different setting as it were mm -hmm. Cool. So that's some of the uh, kind of things. So in terms of the installation, so are we, and this is some of the stuff we've been talking about. So yeah. um, the heat pump in theory could deliver the same as a boiler, um, but it, you know, it's like a very large installation and, and what have you. And then when you come into the cost benefit of like, whether it's like um, a gas boiler or a, or a heat pump is sort of the electricity is around two and a half to three times the cost of gas. Um, which is why we get into the talking about this COPs of 2.5 to 3, because, you you know, if you're getting three times the amount of energy from gas, you know, from the same kilowatt hour you want it, you want it to be the COP to be bridging that gap. Um, so the hot water design is also a key element of this as well. And I think this is something to emphasize. So the operating temperature, usually 30 to 50, um, which means that the radiators may need to be larger because you're essentially trying to radiate more heat uh, uh, with the with the water that's inside them being lower temperature. So um, is that part of the dynamic then? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, if you if you think about it, um, your standard boiler temperatures would be between 65 and 75, uh, maybe a bit higher. Um, so the average temperature in your radiators is at, at those ten, at those levels. And most radiator sizes are quoted um, for a difference in temperature between your radiator mean temperature and your air temperature. So um, generally a, a 
a difference in temperature about 50 degrees. Um, if, however, you're uh, pumping 45, 50 degree water, uh, returning at 35 um, back at your heat pump, uh, your operating temperature, the mean temperature in the radiator is a lot lower. Um, so you then have to look at different tables to size your radiators. And um, it could be like a just a fraction of the output that you're normally used to. And that's why radiators might need to change. Mm -hmm. Or you could, <laughs> you could um, really insulate your home yes. um, and cut your losses. Um, yeah and this is very much like you're, you're thinking about the home as a system and this is like moving away from that boiler you know very hot heat immediate and thinking about heat a uh, home as a system reducing the demand the more the ambient lower temperatures that supplied um the radiators i know talking to the temporary agency energy agency again i think they've they did a lot of testing about different types of radiators uh, underfloor and they felt that it wasn't necessary to do underfloor like some people there seems to be like a popular opinion that you have to have underfloor heating and that's doesn't seem to be the case with tipperary um what they were saying is you might need to oversize your radiators like expand them but just a bit not loads and they were saying in some cases if the if the um if it's a newer radiator then it might tolerate um like the, the change um, but they were saying that like, older ones full of gunk or maybe coming to the end of their life anyway you know might need to change um this is a really good blog that uh, florence has put the link in here um all about um um understanding whether you know a heat pump suitable and going through some of the kind of calculations and things um well this is uh this is this kind of illustrates the point we were talking about so it's a difference yeah. in temperature that that means that the radiators need to be slightly different yeah yeah um okay we've got three examples of what people might end up with um <laughs> are you able to just talk to these uh florence yes uh so this is a an uninsulated stone cottage um and literally just swapped out uh, the boiler for a heat pump system. Um, so what you can see is you have a double, um, I think it's a monoblock actually, mm. um, with the hydronic, but there's a hydronic um, internal unit and a, uh, which has the hot water cylinder in it. And then mm -hmm. this is a buffer tank. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty imposing. Um, oh, sorry, you moved on. Um, a pretty imposing installation. Whereas this is a, um, this was a bungalow that was a high, a high env environmental standard when it was built about 10 years ago, maybe. Um, and that's got a slightly smaller, but this is a split system, I think, uh, with just the external unit and then a hydronic unit inside. And how big is that external unit, just to give people an idea of size? Uh, yeah, that's probably about a metre by, by, um, is it a by five or six okay. hundred. Yeah, so it's not, that. you know, it's not as big as a man, uh, as a woman. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's lift, is it lifted off the ground there? And uh, some people have asked about noise, and you know, is, there, is noise a big issue with these units? Um, it certainly needs to be considered. Mm. And I know some authorities uh, have got quite uppity about, about things, certainly with, flat, uh, with flats. Um, so yeah, it's just something to be aware of. So the, the external unit has a, has a large fan basically, and it will hum, mm. uh, just like your fridge hums, um, but outside. And so you'd need to be careful. And there, there's also, um, so if you're supporting it on the structure, you might get vibration through the structure, mm. but, um, yeah, it's just something that needs considering. Consider. Always worth having a word with the neighbours as well, I guess. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so this one's like more of a stone cottage and and uh, shows a bit of the pipework on the right-hand side. 
Uh, yes. So this is um, Andy's. Is it Andy's? Oh, is it Andy? Hamilton. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. He's a so, member of the Carbon Co-op. Yeah. Yeah. So he's managed to do all of his uh, with a five kilowatt. So those machines were were something like fourteen and eight kilowatt mm -hmm. machines, or maybe even more than that, sixteen and and 12 mm -hmm. um whereas this is just a five kilowatt uh for a stone cottage which she has insulated inside and then his extensions insulated uh i think to similarly maybe benefit them mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> Excuse yeah. Me. um and then all those pipes are his uh underfloor heating pipes mm, yeah um, and there's a we've got a great video of this actually or, uh, we can share later where he talks about that yeah how about this one this looks like a bit of a more modern uh, yes house. so this is just in south manchester um it's a bungalow that's been re uh, remodeled um with cavity insulation and uh, underfloor heating and uh, that's an eight kilowatt eco dam uh, Oh, sorry. This is no. This is the. This is a semi. Sorry, it's mm. a semi which hasn't had huge amounts. It's been extended to um, building regs insulation. Um, there's been some additional insulation in the roof. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure this could have been a, a five kilowatt installation had we worked a little bit um, on it, but mm. the. The installer originally created for an 11 kilowatt. Wow. Um, and we can we will talk about sizing a bit as we yeah. go on, because I know we're throwing some numbers about here, but it's, it's kind of an important aspect. But we can come to that later. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose this the, this does like uh, illustrate the need for some space. I mean, you know, um, they're not the, they're not massive, they're huge, but they do require some outdoor space, some indoor space. Um, yeah. And some. And, and you know some pipe works and stuff. So that's that gives a nice illustration of different ways that people have implemented them, different ways, and we'll have a look at some other case studies as we go along. Um, so in terms of getting uh, getting your home heat pump ready, I think we've um, we've talked about that about understanding the home as an energy system. Really, that um, you know um, if you can imagine like today's heating system. Um, it's some kind of like houses that are not particularly well insulated, that have be, be, relatively big, powerful heating systems in the middle of them, you know, gas boilers um, that are running on high when it's needed. The house, the house cools down, you put the boiler on or, or a, um, a thermostat triggers it. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of a heat pump, it's like reconfiguring that system. So it's reducing the heating need. Um, it's about reducing the heat loss. Um, understanding that heating system as kind of um, a lower, a lower but more constant heating system, uh, and approaching it accordingly. And so, in terms of the um, the um, retrofit, we always talk about a whole house approach. That means like tackling a property together holistically. Um, uh, that might mean in one big bang, or it might mean over time. But it, but the idea here is that you don't have unintended consequences. You make one room really warm, and then the others are really cold, and then the condensation. Or that you do it, you make a um, an improvement that you then need to come back to later because you need to put windows, you need to take out the insulation, what have you. So we're talking about reducing that demand first through improving the fabric. Um, rather than like, um, yeah, just shoving a load of PVs on it. Um, what kind of levels of retrofit are we talking about, Florence? You know, are we talking people have to go to the nth degree or can people just, you know, put up some thicker curtains or? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, uh, I would go for as low as you can afford to go. Um, mm. I mean, if you're going to, if you, if you're definitely going for a heat pump installation, it's not it's not the cheapest. So you might as well make everything work um, together. And um, and actually, the cost of the heat pump does depend on the size of the heat pump to, to a large mm. extent. So um, if you, 
I, I think if you're trying to make an impact on uh, your carbon footprint, which is what you will do by going electric and um, getting heat um, out of electric at those kinds of performance um, mm. criteria. Um, I think a good rule, rule of thumb really would be to, um, to make sure you're not spending as much money in terms of the cost of that energy. So if you're able to cut your heat losses by 75, 80%, um, then you will see a, um, you'll see no, no increase in your bills, but you will be drastically cutting your um, carbon footprint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's this basically the idea of the system and, you know, tackling one bit to enable the other. And we'll talk, we'll come on and we'll talk a little bit about how sizing, how we, how we size heat pumps and how that has an impact in terms of heat. heat. Um, so your air tightness and ventilation being part of this as well, uh, something to emphasize, yeah? Yes, definitely. Um, so definitely buildings need to breathe and you need to breathe. And in the, um, in the summer, you also have to get a lot more ventilation in just to keep um, comfortable. So um, when we talk about high or really good air tightness, we're not talking about completely sealing up your building, but we are sealing it uh, when it when it counts and when it matters. Um, and if you have a leaky fabric, you're basically having uncontrolled ventilation um, and you're losing heat by um, either uh, warm air leaking out or you get infiltration, which is cold air coming in, uh, which you then have to heat up to your room temperature. And that all has an impact on how big your um, heating system needs to be. Mm. Um, and definitely, uh, if you go down a sort of uh, passive house or NFIT, uh, which is the retrofit standard um, for passive house route, um, then part of that is mechanical ventilation with um, heat recovery, which means you can get to those um, uh, levels of air tightness, but still have really good um, indoor air quality that's you know, it's filtered fresh air coming in. Um, at a basic rate that you need um, without, but then you recover the heat before you um, exhaust it through your wet room. So all that moisture that's um, being uh, produced in the kitchens and the bathrooms, that goes straight out of the building. So you don't get the conditions for mold to grow in your houses um, and all, all the problems um, associated with that. Um, and before it goes out of the building, you recover that heat. So that heat that you in a in a normal building if you just had extra ventilation you would have to heat up to your um uh your room temperature you don't actually have that load um to the same extent at all uh, mm -hmm. you know you probably you're probably having to put just 10 percent of that um that heat in mm -hmm. um, so i think um so i think the message there <laughs> Like you know, reduce the heat demand. Think of the think of the home as a system, and this is a different kind of energy source in the middle of that system. Um, reduce demand through insulation, air tightness, but think about ventilation. But I think you know, as you've you know, this is your slightly like perfect <laughs> is the enemy of good, you know. So do as much as you can, you know. Um, it doesn't you don't need to be living in a passive house property to um, be doing this and. It, Interestingly, as Florence said, we've there's a uh, we have a um, a kind of techies group, Eco Home Lab, where uh, one of the people's been trying to prove how much they can do without do, almost doing anything. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't we wouldn't recommend it. Um, he's a, an engineer. Um, <laughs> so yeah, doing the best you can, getting people builders in, involved. I mean, obviously, people powered retrofit is one of the ways to do that, and um, and obviously we can signpost other contractors and what have you. Yeah. Um, so let's think if you do, if you do want to go ahead with it, um, what do you need to bear in mind? We're thinking about where to locate. So we're talking about these the different size of systems that we were looking at, you know, where in, where in the house should people be thinking about citing these things, you know? Um, yeah. So 
you will need an, an external location mm. and um so that's one thing to consider and if you're going for the monoblock which is um what the all-in-one unit outside then there's a maximum 12 meter distance i think uh with a split system you can actually do um uh, larger distances mm. um and that's possibly uh more suitable for, for the larger houses um, and then you need to locate a you would unless you were doing your hot water separately uh, by some other means you mm. need to um, locate a hot, a hot water cylinder or a thermal stool um, I don't know if we've got time to go through the differences between hot water and thermal stool but maybe if there's a question at the end <laughs> mm. we can go through that um, and then you may need a buffer tank uh, you may need a water filter depending on where you are mm. um, and your expansion vessels. Mm -hmm. And yeah, here's a, a sort of um, diagrammatic illustration of those different bits then. Yeah. Um, and like you say, the relatively keeping things relatively close together. Um, having a controller, uh, <laughs> <that's> a, <laughs> another thing to emphasize. Uh, but yeah, this is it briefly illustrates the kind of different aspects of the system. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost? I think that's perhaps the question everyone's dying to ask. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about sizing, but as you've said, the size of a heat pump does have an impact on the cost. Um, and then we've also got things like the insulation, but these additional things that we've talked about. Um, and we can talk, we'll talk about grants and RHI, but in in here you've put five thousand to fourteen thousand. So does that cost? Does that include the cost of installation then? Um. So I think the five thousand pounds was Andy's cost, mm. and that <laughs> that must have included installation. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But if you're going for a renewable heat incentive, mm. the costs seem to be a lot higher. Um. There will be all sorts of reasons for that, um, but uh, it's whether you want to get. So what will happen is you get a, a grant back over seven years, mm. um, and eventually the difference between what you put in at the start, and that's your capital investment, and what you get back in, in a grant will be in the region of one and a half to two and a half thousand pounds. It depends on your installation. So basically the cost of a new boiler. Um, mm. So <laughs> mm, mm. Um, I think it's a cash flow decision whether you go for mm. the renewable heating center or not. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do go for a monoblock and you are handy uh, mm. with plumbing, the, um, who was it? Install his own. I can't remember. Oh, Tristan. Tristan, yes. Yeah, <laughs> the engineer. Um, he managed, yeah, he managed to install his own. So obviously, um, the cost was was just of the of the, the materials, but um, it does take a lot a lot of um, manpower. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and knowledge. Um, so uh, I would definitely go for a um, someone who knows what they're doing, basically. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I was talking, I was doing some research with installers and they were saying about a week to install, like some, do you think that's reasonable? Uh, possibly overall, mm. Um, mm. I think, um, I think that eight and a half kilowatt eco down, I think they just installed it in a day or two. Yes. Um, but it does depend whether you need, but then the cylinder came a bit later. Yeah. So it does depend how much other work needs to be done and what happened was because they hadn't been using the upstairs radiators very much mm. uh, and they were the same radiators they'd had for over 30 years i think mm. uh they sprang a leak when they were trying to oh, push no. <laughs> so, uh, so they thought they weren't going to have to um change any radiators but in the end they, they did so that yeah. you, you've also got to have those kinds of contingencies yeah yeah now we've just mentioned uh renewable heat incentive briefly there um, and there's, um, we're not going to go too much into this and do the calculations for you. There is, there's uh, eligibility criteria there on the Ofgem website. There's also some calculators out there that you can, mm. uh, the government website has one. Um, but in very broad terms, 
So what we're talking about with renewable heat incentive is you pay the cost up front of installation, and then over time, your your you you get a grant basically that comes comes back to you. Um, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so the eligibility is in part dependent on carrying out some installation work and having an EPC um, that kind of demonstrates that you, you're not living in a in a open uh, farm building. Um, and um, so the grant. The grant's paid over seven years and it's calculated at a rate per kilowatt hours. Am I right in thinking it's not meet, it's not based on metered use, but on modelled use? Or am I wrong? Uh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think it's modelled use. Yeah, I think it's modelled. I, uh, yeah. I think there might be a requirement to hit, fit a, meet, a meter as part of it. Uh, but it's not. Uh, you can get an on. extra grant if you've got monitoring equipment. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there is a there is a cap to it as well, isn't there? So it means if you if you're installing a very big system, there's going to be a limit to that what what you'll get back, you know. Yeah, and for an air source heat pump, that's twenty thousand kilowatt hours. Mm. Mm. Um, you also need an MCS of coated installer. Yes. I think it might well be. Is it phasing out though? I think it might. Stop. Well, the yeah, there is a. Um, it has there has been an end to it uh, signaled several times since it's been extended. Uh, there is talk about it um, finishing in a year. Um, mm -hmm. So um, uh, and obviously there's quite a lot of flux here with the green homes grant schemes that have incentivized heat pumps and then um, um, I mean it's very much in flux in terms of what's happening in green homes grant. We believe it's being phased out. Um, mm -hmm. So and the green homes grant has led to a huge increase in 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 interest in heat pumps but also then a, a tightening of supply in 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 part to brexit as well so it is <laughs> is a a cloudy scene um and now, as you said before the grant the grant ultimately kind of pays off a significant portion of the capital costs and so you're left with a bit of capital costs and and the ongoing running costs um, and will the running cost be more or less the same as a gas boiler or will there be, you know, will there be a difference there? I know it's hard to generalise. Uh, well, yeah, uh, this is where the sort of you know, straight swap out means you'll actually pay more because um, you, uh, because electricity, um, electricity, is about three times more expensive but if you don't um if you don't optimize your air source heat pump and you just um you just get the the size that you you've been quoted it's generally not an efficient size so mm -hmm. you will end up um uh, uh spending more energy or using more energy than you thought you might be doing if that cop is is lower than yeah. you, than the three three point five but um um, if it's well optimized and properly sized, will you be paying about the same then? If you, if you know, if you're using it properly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And if you really go for it, you'll be, you'll be. Uh, actually, you could go for an, um, one of those tariffs. Uh, agile. The agile tariffs. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and they're being, if you can optimize, there's a really good graph um, on LinkedIn actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, dug it out um but if you can because there's inertia in the system you can operate your heat pump at the best times for the best um uh rates um so yeah mm. so these are them. these are electricity tariffs that vary by the half hour every single half hour and they vary differently every day they're published a day in advance but uh, for heat pump uh, owners or electric vehicle chargers, they can work out very good. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we talked about MCS, uh, the micro generation certification. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to say society. And uh, <laughs> so the installers need that accreditation to be able to install a heat pump that you will then, that you can then gain um, the renewable heat incentive. And the um, MCF website can help you find an MCS accredited installer in your area. Um, you know, I think there's 10 in, in Manchester, Greater Manchester, but the number is in, in increasing. People are seeing that there's demand, you know. So what makes viability? 
um, having the outdoor indoor space, um, meeting the criteria for noise, you know, not, not having it too close to someone else might be followed by that. The radiator sizes, making sure they're right. The, the retrofit measures and bringing, bringing down the demand. The costs and the cash flow, as Flo said, like being able to pay up front and get it back over time. There are some uh, schemes there where you can help you with the upfront costs. Obviously, there's a cost to that. Um, so switching from gas is difficult in the current market conditions. But I mean, uh, we've seen case studies with oil, you know, in Ireland as peat even. So it's a really good, I mean, it's a really good case if you're moving in an off-grid context, but increasing it's getting better in a gas context. And um, it's justified in terms of the CO2, the, the carbon emissions. And I think, yeah, we didn't really emphasize that enough that in the UK, the the electricity system is fast decarbonizing through more renewables on the grid, whereas gas will always be gas. It will always be a non-renewable hydrocarbon. It will never get more, you know, less carbon intensive. Um, so in terms of you've made a decision, you think about it, you're going to go for it. Um, heat losses then. So what, what we're talking about in this context is you might bring in an energy assessor to do this, or you might bring in an installer who could do this assessment. But when they do an assessment, what are they what are they doing here, uh, Flo? Um, so they're looking at um, how your house is built. Um, so the fabric of your walls, the, the quality of your windows, um, how much insulation you've got, how much ventilation you've got. Um, and that all um, amounts to uh, a heat loss and the heat loss is driven by a difference in temperature between inside and outside so you're trying to maintain say 20 degrees inside and um, temperature outside is, is fluctuating as you know and um, the peak heat load uh, is the amount of energy you need to put into your house uh, to keep it at that 20 degrees plus or minus um, while the temperature outside is at the, des the design temperature for your uh, particular location. Mm -hmm. um, the design temperature is a temperature that's exceeded historically um, mm. by a certain percentage, and I can't mm. remember exactly how much. Um, so it's not, it's not the most extreme temperature that you'll ever experience outside. Mm. Um, it's one that you can probably live with uh, um most of the time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that determines the size of your machine mm, mm. um so when we talk about the eight kilowatts or the five kilowatt that's the size mm. of your machine mm -hmm. um the amount of energy you actually uh consume uh is the area under the graph so if your load is going up and down based on, on what's happening outside or your thermostat um being turned down in, in inside um the consumption is the area under the graph, so it's the amount, it's that that peak um, multiplied by the hours mm -hmm. um, that you're you're running it at that at that um, time at that level. Yeah. Um, so you, it's not as easy. It's not as easy. You can't work back from your bills, for example. No. Um, to determine your um, heat pump size, although it will give you an idea based on on what. Um, yeah. Uh, how, what your house is like so really to make this kind of investment which is a long-term investment significant amount of money need someone to come out do this assessment work the you know there's a, a bit of calculation required and this comes through to the emitter sizes so the radiator sizes and um, looking at a room by room heat loss calculation because sometimes not not every not everyone does that um but it's like looking at the radiator types and sizes and obviously underfloor heating comes into this as well. So yeah, really important to get that, that, you know, detailed assessment done, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then I guess in terms of the calculation and looking at, you know, designing the system, then it, it comes down to the, the hot water as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So, an so a, a domestic hot water cylinder is one uh, where you, you get mains water, it fills up the, the cylinder and it gets heated up by the uh, whatever's inside it. So it's either a coil that's fed by your boiler system or your air source heat pump. And then there's probably an immersion as well. 
Uh, you can get immersion only heaters, you can get ones that are solar ready, etc. Um, but basically the, the water that's inside the tank is the one that comes out of your tap. Uh, whereas the thermal store is a store of water where you just, um, uh, where you circulate your, your heating uh, water. Um, and then it's the, it's the mains cold water that comes in, gets mm. heated up inst instantly, mm. and then comes back out and comes to your pipes. Quite Is there a pros and cons to these? <laughs> um, so the reason why you would normally have a, a cylinder as opposed to, so uh, in large houses with lots of bathrooms, um, you would go for a cylinder mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. just to have enough hot water at the, at the same time um to feed all those wet um wet services um and also at the right pressure mm -hmm. um whereas uh if you're going for a combi boiler which is instantaneous or a thermal store with instantaneous mm. hot water um you're obviously relying on um how much heat you can put in at the, that particular moment and if you've got a 25 kilowatt boiler um, obviously, you can deliver that heat um, really quickly, and as the um, as the water comes in and out. Um, but if you've only got a five kilowatts mm -hmm. source heat pump, you can't actually deliver that heat to the to the the cold water mains. That's why, um, uh, yeah, you need um, you need some inertia in the system. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's kind of assessment and design and like, I mean, if you're particularly keen, that's something you could do and there's some resources out there, so there's some, a link there um, or some various links here. Um, it might be that you bring an assessor, an energy assessor in, Carbon Corp with the people hard retrofit, we do assessments which are retrofit, but we also include an element on heat pumps. Um, or there are specialist heat pump installer, um, assessors that will just do an assessment with a heat pump in mind. And there's also installers that will do an assessment as part of their uh, kind of quoting. What would say is, um, and talking to MCS about this, is that um, installers, you know, it's their time, you know, so if they come out and do an assessment and then you don't take it forward, um, it's it's their lost, you know, time and they want to make a good, as, good a job as that as possible. So it some of them will charge and that's not necessarily a bad thing so you might look for some independent advice from an assessor you might go with an installer um, but yeah it's important i think some of these things that i'll be asking about um about how they're going to deal with these different things making sure they do room by room heat loss and that sort of thing um so there are many types out there um so in terms of choosing choosing a model and going for it we've got deciding the type and like you know making making a judgment on ground source or air source um, choosing an installer designing the system potentially an engineer could be part of that uh, such as Florence mm -hmm. installing it and commissioning an operate operation which we're going to talk about um, uh, what was this <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a tool from the BRE. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, you can have a play with to compare different. Um, so they've got a whole database of actually in actual installed models, and you can just have a play around with um, with um, putting those models in and seeing mm -hmm. the SPF um, for those particular installations. Um, one thing we didn't mentioned was you can you can also what you can also do and this might be um a better way to go about it is to uh decide on um is to make sure your heat pump is sized for the heat losses but maybe maybe you could live with a smaller heat pump if you're between models and then just see how you go and have some kind of backup heating Mm, uh, on mm. top of that so even you know if you've already got um uh, uh some kind of electric heater somewhere or you think you could live with a couple of electric heaters on top um then 
that's your heat pump will run efficiently most of the time mm. um, in that case, rather than oversizing it and then running it inefficiently. Because that's the it's danger that it's oversized, it runs inefficiently, and it's only oversized to meet demand on one or two days a year, the peak, yeah, exactly. or maybe not even a year. Um, I know Andy Hamilton has a wood burning stove. You know, he lives in a very rural area, uh, but yeah. Um, okay, well, let's look at let's finish off by looking at some examples um, um, with a bit with some of the detail in. Do you want to yeah. uh, talk about this one? Yeah, so this was the bungalow that we saw earlier. This is in France, um, and it's a split unit, eight kilowatts, ten year old installation. But as you can see, it's got underfloor heating, uh, a decent level of insulation, but it wasn't a passive house. Um, that's the cylinder, hot water cylinder there um there are only two bathrooms and one of them's a bath so i think it's from oh no it's not oversized because it's got the solar thermal mm. uh, panels on the roof there um so yeah it's pretty big but there's um it's it's a there's space in this mm -hmm. house mm -hmm. so i mean um next one is uh oh this was the the bungalow Mm -hmm. uh, South of Manchester, um, it's got cavity wall insulation. It's sort of re, you know, it was redone. Um, floor insulation and roof insulation. Uh, according to the EPC, it's eight thousand six hundred kilowatt hours of, uh, a year of heating, um, and uh, I think she paid seven thousand five hundred for an RHI compliant installation. So not. Not too bad, really. And sorry, I think we might have. Sorry, the slide. I might have gone ahead one. So oh, sorry. I'm, I'm on the Mitsubishi Ikadan eight kilowatts. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh... But then that's the one you've been talking to now. Yeah. Yeah. So the next one is the Daikin Altherma monoblock. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is the massive one, mm. um, and that's sixteen kilowatts. Um, this is my dad's. <laughs> <laughs> um, also in France, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, he just he just he wanted to get rid of his oil fired boiler and hot water cylinder, and for him, uh, just going straight to a heat pump uh, means he's saving um, hundreds of euros. Yeah, so wow. That was that was his driver. Again, that that difference between oil and heat pump being really really market and this yeah, is the although point. I have to Sorry. say I think in Ireland oil is expensive but in in the UK there are areas where oil isn't that expensive yeah that's, <laughs> it's that's quite hard to uh, it's quite hard to um yeah that came up recently didn't it because it's been a yes. real drop off the cliff of, uh, of oil prices but I mean in the long term that will be relatively temporary so the yeah. last one's at 8.5 Mitsubishi Kodan Yes, this is the one which was a semi, and I think it could probably have gone a bit smaller and mm. a bit more um, work. Although they'd recently uh, done the extension and they insulated the roof, so I think they, they did as much as they could for their mm. budget. Um, they also wanted a battery, so uh, you know their budget didn't quite extend. Um, other stuff so mm. um yeah and it's got a bespoke 150 litre cylinder because they only had a tiny mm. um um what should we call it cupboard <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um they they might have got away with it with you know a smaller cylinder it's just a retired couple three beds mm. mm. um shower room rather than bath um and that was 12 so that was 12,500 but they went for an ultra quiet model mm. so that was like with you know R32. thinking about neighbors and what have you yeah yeah and that's with the new r32 refrigerant as well right so we didn't go through uh global warming potential refrigerants but they are coming down mm, mm, mm. okay and we're yeah. just finish off with um, some words about installation and monitoring um, so yeah uh, I think we we always emphasize on our webinars the importance of design 
in terms of a uh, specification and a manufacturer's instructions as well. Um, obviously, there's the interaction with the MCS qualification of the installer, um, but it's important for that design element to take place and to look at any other additional bits of the system. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, a meticulous and experienced plumber, um, <laughs> maybe better mm -hmm. for a monoblock installation. Neat is good. Um, yeah, and obviously the competencies, it's, you know, plumbers who get into heat pump installations, although some electricians as well, you know, some crossover. Um, controls and monitoring. Um, this is really like a boom area. And my colleague Ben is really big on this in terms of the ability to um, access the data that's coming from your heat pump to understand how it's working, sort of go beyond just the kind of apps that there might be available um, and to be able to diagnose when, you know, it's maybe not operating to its fullest potential, being able to integrate things like thermostats and zone controls and that sort of thing. Uh, oh yeah, here's the monitoring. Um, as we were talking about uh, uh, Open Energy Monitor, who's like Tristan, who's the person we talk about, um, system here, but there are also other increasingly installers and manufacturers are making their systems more open than they have been in the past. So you're able to understand and interrogate data rather than just, you know, look at it on a printed page or a screen. Um, so that monitoring, uh, commissioning as well, we'll talk about um, things that might affect performance um there's a few things here we're kind of running short on time so we've talked about under and oversizing um what about compressor cycling do you want to just mention that Flo? uh yes so your heat pump doesn't run um continuously it's um well a bit like your fridge actually you mm. can hear it clicking on and then it hums for a bit and it comes up Again, that's why you need a bit of buffer. Um, and the cycling is the number of times it does that in an hour or whatever it is. I can't remember the mm. time period. Um, and, but in order to, but what they've shown is that the cycling is actually quite, um, quite problematic in terms of overall efficiency. Mm. Um, so you want to be able to um, reduce the amount of, the number of times that your uh, compressor's clicking on and off. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I think that's when Ben was talking about some of the data, he's able to diagnose, you know, remotely, or oh, oh, can see it's not working properly because it's coming on and off all the time. So, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, we talk a bit more about compressor <laughs> cycling here, yeah. Um, so there are some things, yeah, some possible things to look out for. Um, yes. Okay, I think uh, I'm probably going to bring it to a close now because um, yeah, sure. uh, I really want to get to questions, but um, there are a few things on diagnostics there. But um, yeah, I think we've covered everything we needed to. It's not a boiler. Hopefully that's clear now. Um, hopefully people understand the things that we need to do to make the house heat pump ready. Um, and we've talked about the different components, the different space requirements, what have you. We've looked at assessment and how big and trying to keep them as small as possible, um, different types, best for people's needs, and a little brief thing at the end about installation, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, so questions, we've got 21 questions to get through in 20 minutes, so they want a minute. Uh, let's see what we can do. <laughs> we'll open the chat accidentally rather than the Q&A. There's 28 questions. Um, Oh, yeah, I'm doing the quick fire ones. <laughs> okay, so Mick asks, how do you get how do you get um, different temperatures for hot water and heating? Uh, if you want 50 degree hot water, but your underfloor or radiators will be okay with 35, 40, how does that work? Yeah, um, so so the 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 air source heat pump can. Um, and deliver, you know, it, it will be diverted to your hot water tank as a priority. Uh, well, you can set the priority of whether it's hot water or your heating. When it's, when it diverts, um, it can kick up the delivery temperature um, to your, to your, your hot water cylinder and have um, higher 
um, operating temperatures. So it'll still do that, it will just be less efficient. So the COP drops dramatically when you do that. Um, and you might decide to not do that and just always run your heat pump at uh, lower temperatures and then just use an immersion top up um, for your hot water cylinder. Cool. Does that make sense? Um, I'm going to go through these in different ways. So, um, um, oh, microbore piping. What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you install a heat pump if your home has it? Uh, I think I'd need a bit more um, uh, context. So microbore just means very small yes. bore pipes. Um, and it works really well for hot water. So, um, so for example, if you had a, a manifold off your hot water cylinder, you could then have individual microbore pipes to your um, fittings and they would deliver hot water much faster um, than the traditional uh, you know a delivered system and network um, if you have microbore for your underfloor heating I think it's just a fouling it's just a I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily mm -hmm. a problem for a heat pump mm -hmm. uh, Maybe unless, the unless the pressures aren't are too high. Yeah, and Not something sure. to take up with the installer as well. Um, yeah, maybe there's thing, an installer on here. There's a number <laughs> of there's a number of questions about how far you have to go with energy efficiency and spending sixty five thousand pounds and going to passive house and I think what we tried to communicate there was that it's not necessary to do that and I think the way to think about it and th this is the way that we why we do retrofit assessments with heat pump uh, sizing because it's it's part of that the lower you bring down demand the lower you can have the heat pump size and therefore the cheaper so there's sort of like a a, a calculation a <laughs> yeah but there's a calculation as well between the money yeah. i spend on the money i spend on fabric and the reduction and the saving i get from the heat pump and yeah. And it, it, so it's very hard to be like, this is what you need to do. And people have said, is it around EPCs or kilowatt hours per, you know, ultimately, and we, we use full SAP to do it, but there are other tools out there that can use it as well. Um, but ultimately that's our assessment methodology builds in that. Um, but, but I mean, essentially you can build you can build these sizing things with spreadsheets. This is, I guess we're talking to the more technical people here because some people yeah, sure. just want to talk to an assessor or an installer, but mm. um, yeah, I suppose we it, can't be any more accurate than that. Flo. No, I mean, it very de much depends on uh, your motivations for doing these kinds of things. And, you know, I've, I've done uh, a recent calculation for a very it was it's quite a small property you know it's just a you go in it's the lounge kitchen and then there's an upstairs bedroom which could be two bedrooms in the shower room um old stone cottage old old uh brick cottage semi um and we did the calculations and you know you can put x amount into the fabric and not need any kind of heating system at all apart from maybe a couple of rads so it, there's there's always going to be a trade off and um, there will be uh, and you might consider um, just a few a few electric rads just because of the way you operate your spaces you might be quite comfortable at 16 17 degrees um, whereas the majority of the population isn't <laughs> um, so um, it really does depend on your individual circumstances and. Mm -hmm. Um, there's embodied carbon in in putting in a system yeah. which you're then going to have to replace in 20 30 years time whereas if you put that if you put that embodied carbon into the fabric that's going to la last a lot longer mm. um, so there's there's all sorts of calculations that you could do to justify <laughs> um, all sorts and we have a question about motivations um, yes. in terms of the people we work with there are a number of motivations one one thing i would say is there has been a huge huge increase in the um demand really for heat pump 
uh, assessments and, and installations and that sort of thing. Really, I would say in the last year, I, I feel a lot of it's down to climate emergency, extinction rebellion, a greater awareness of environmental factors and people feeling I need to do something. Here is yeah. something I can do in my home. Um, the technology has become more reliable as well. People are a bit yes. more aware of it as well. And so there's there's a great deal of people that are motivated by carbon and and around, around green issues. Uh, what, what would you say, Florence, people you come into contact with? Um, well, certainly if, if carbon's the motivation um, and over, you know, and extinction, <laughs> um, you might be equally in, interested in long-term carbon as you are um, just getting yourself off the grid. So, um, or getting off, yeah, getting yourself off the, the gas grid. Um, but uh, there will always be a balance to be made with budgets and, and what you can afford. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you get, if you're getting four kilowatts of heat for one kilowatt of electricity, um, that kind of, and, you know, the electricity is half the emissions of um, gas, then you're really cutting down your, your footprint just, just by making that decision, aren't you? Um, it's just being aware that it's just not not that straightforward. Mm, mm. Um, we've got um, an answer to the microbore issue. <laughs> uh, Radiators of <laughs> microbore don't really work with heat pumps. As heat pump heat pump temperature difference between flow and return is five degrees C, whereas boiler ah, yes, radiators yes, are about twenty degrees C difference. So flow rates need to go up for the heat yes. pumps. So large diameter pipes are needed to reduce the uh, pumping costs. That yes, was from anonymous much. attendee, but uh, I think you've obviously got very specialist knowledge. So thank you for. No, that's absolutely right. Um, on that. Yeah, because you're, as he says, so you're you're you're, your flow rates and the pressure you need um, uh, to push that flow rate is dependent on um, that dif difference in temperature between flow and flow return. Um, yeah, there's some so other might... questions. Uh, one, um, is the heat loss assessment the same as or covered by an EPC rating? Um, the EPC rating is uh, deficient in quite a lot of um, uh, areas. And actually, you can have, there's uh, another graph that's really interesting, um, which shows the actual consumption for different um, for different properties within the same EPC band, and it just keeps varying and it comes back down. And you know, so you can have an EPCA um, uh, that actually consumes a lot of energy compared with an EPC D that's being used completely differently. Um, so the EPC is 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 really raw data, and it's it's really only to compare the bricks and mortar of your building compared with a, a benchmark. Um, when it comes to actual uh, sizing or consumption, um, you need a few more a few more calculations in there. And yeah. you need to include a lot more because um, the EPC is literally just heating and a little bit of electricity. And there's um, a common sense test there as well. Like, I mean, I'm not doing down EPC assessors, but but I know some EPCs cost thirty five pounds. You know that they, they're not they're not uh, the amount of time required to kind of inform a design like this. So just you know, um, there's a question here about uh, getting rid of gas altogether, which is uh, one of the key motivations to talked about. Um, is there can there be a payment uh, required for that by the gas supplier? I um, believe so. Um, so. That um, semi that had an eight and a half kilowatt eco dam, they had to pay to remove the the gas meter, and then pay again to remove something else. Or they or they still had to pay the, st the standing charges, even though they had they didn't have a meter anymore or something like that. It's I haven't looked into it, but I will because that's exactly what I want to do here. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean we. Um... It's One of our crazy. members, yeah, was being hit with a, a few thousand pound bill 
Uh, one thing we did was support them in arguing with the gas distribution uh, organization, and they won that battle in the end. But, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that wouldn't have fought with that and would have just paid it because they were essentially paying a standing charge for not using anything until yeah. they settled it. So, yeah. Someone's just said they've paid 80 quid to remove the gas meter. Well, that's yeah. that's not too... That I mean, that probably sounds about right, you know, yeah. but... Um, uh, one of our members was being was was being faced with a bill for like three thousand pounds. You know, it was like a lot of money, and and clearly not not um, not not commensurate with the amount of work being done. Um, mm. There's some uh, uh, question here about agile tariff, um, octopus agile, which is that you know every half hour by uh, Chris is asking about that. So uh, heat pumps, there are some heat pumps that integrate with that, and I think. Um, this is behind like the part of the reason why heat pumps until very recently it was very hard to interface with a heat pump you know if you're a third party you know um you need it you need to be in their system or you know uh, be like accredited within with the manufacturer now it's becoming more open it's easier to to um integrate but also in potentially being able to automate when they come on and off and and match that with signals from things like octopus agile so there's a small number of those and i think they're becoming larger there's there's lots of i uh, we, uh, we get lots of specialist forums around octopus and people um so yeah do check those out for more details really and also we have our um carbon corp um uh forum where we get a lot of this as well um and i think so, there's someone on the call who's uh pointed us to their website energystats.uk oh yes fantastic um, yeah that's great uh we follow the twitter um yeah oh great i sometimes think we're, yeah we've got so many experts in the network <laughs> yeah. um let's just pick some last questions we've got five minutes left um Someone was asking, is it, does it make sense to run it re the heat pump really hard at night, low cost, low carbon, store the heat in a buffer tank and use it in the day? Does that make sense? Um, well, you could definitely charge your hot water tank, couldn't you? And, um, and your, peak, your peak load is, in fact, uh, at the end of the night, as in early morning before the sun rises. Um, the heating because that's when the temperature drops right down so yes mm. probably mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a partly you know part of the rationale for the um for the agile tariff as well you know run it when it's cheap um okay i'm oh, oh, sorry we're trying to get through as many questions someone's asked about the heat pump monitoring equipment there is a standard specification i believe um if you look on the um the uh, Energy Savings Trust website or the government website, they've got a lot of information on there uh, that can hopefully help you out. Um, let's see. Um, can, can a small heat pump be connected to an existing gas or oil boiler? Uh, I'm not sure. We had a little bit of a discussion about hybrid heat pumps before and using them with oh, gas and yeah. and and kind of there. I think one of the things is you want to you, if you want to get rid of your standing charge, you want to focus on like more environmental stuff. It's probably better to go the full way, really, um, uh, rather than kind of have this halfway house where you're still paying for the gas and you're using the heat pump. But um, I guess it is a possibility of designing a system but it might be fairly complex to build in other heat sources yeah yeah the controls would be um significant <laughs> 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 and maybe competing i would try to yeah i would uh, i would try to keep things simple in a house to be honest Yes. Yeah. And I think, yeah, uh, in terms of systems, robustness of systems, simple is better, you know, yes. in terms of like efficiency and not breaking down. Because um, we've got a few questions about can I bring this in? Can I bring that in? Um, how do we get independent advice and not get ripped off? Well, <laughs> come to things like this. There's lots of advice forums online. MCS, if you're using an MCS accredited installer, MCS is there, you know, if you feel uh, for, for more information or if you feel you've been ripped off, you know, 
Um, we've had a question about heat batteries and sun amp uh, from anonymous attendee again. And Dom McCann, who's at Zapperman on um, on uh, Twitter, um, has a sun amp uh, and has, has done a fair amount of information sharing at uh, Eco Home Lab about it and online as well. And um, uh, and he he's very complimentary about them actually. You know, relatively small, but you know it's uh, had an impact and been efficient yeah um how do i know about the fabric of my home well anthony you get you get a um you get someone who knows what it's built of an assessor to come around or you can spend a lot of time on the internet figuring out you know what it is so um yeah um yeah. is the mcs heat pump calculator excel spreadsheet good at good to use i don't know have you used it Hello? No, I haven't. Um, but I'm having to comment on uh, on a certain selection, so I think I might try it. But I think it's it it's very conservative, and um, yeah, it could give you an idea, you know, a starting point. Um, but it's basically what the installer would use as well. So that um, that going for a, for a, uh, a heat pump that's that's too big to start with is mm. Um, mm. is is a risk. And I think that one thing to state is like some of the reasons for oversizing are people that are conservative, like they want to size for that peak load, and that's perhaps you know how. Um, you know, some gas boilers are over big as well, you know, and don't necessarily work as efficient as they should do, which is mm -hmm. another part of the story we haven't really talked about, the cost benefit. You know, not mm -hmm. all gas boilers are optimized either, you know, um, but it's kind of accepted um, in the UK, really. Um, but yeah, if they're being conservative, they oversize, you know, and that's where that's where the some of the lower COPs come in. Let's end on this last one from Chris. How do you avoid the apparent horrors of icing on the evaporator? If that happens, is it bad for the system design or sizing or something? Is it because of the bad system design, sizing or something else? Um, I think you'd be you'd be very unlucky to have that happen to you with the the newer uh, models. They all have uh, defrost inbuilt defrost cycles. Mm. Um, and even the one in the bungalow in France, I think my dad serviced last year for the first time because of ice buildup. Um, and that was, you know, so it's a 10 year old uh, machine. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Okay. As long as you don't cover it up. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> lots of people want to sort of, you know, uh, conceal it. Uh, and you can, you can put something over the top to keep, keep the elements off. The top and and shade it so it doesn't fade in the sun or whatever yeah um, but you really need to keep it as uh, unobstructed as possible for it to work um properly fantastic um yes so we've done our best to get us through as much as we can tonight i know there's some questions there's a lot of detailed questions um it is really hard to answer all the very detailed questions and i apologize for that what we do have is eco home lab uh, which you can find online but it's a monthly meetup where we get very very geeky about things like heat pumps and monitoring and metering and all that sort of thing um tristan who we've talked about from open energy monitor is there people are very welcome to come to that and present and to um propose very technical interesting geeky things uh where we talk about all these things we also have a forum on the carbon court website uh, which is community.carbon.coop. Um, and that's a great place to kind of like engage in this kind of discussion as well. Um, I would really, really like you to look at the chat and click on this Jamboard link. Um, this will give us feedback on today's session, which is what we, we would, we'd love really, and to, uh, for you to let us know how we've done tonight. Um, 